Jeff, welcome Brent. back to another episode of Babylon 5. For the very first time, coming off A War Without End Parts 1 and 2, we slide right into this new episode. Gray 17 is missing. Yeah. You know, last week I was like, oh my gosh, this is the beginning. Babylon 5 starts from here. And here we are. <laughs> here we are. It has started. Yes, it has. It has. It has. <laughs> it has. We'll talk about it. I So folks, Jeff and I don't really talk about the episode much before this moment right here. And I don't know where Jeff is on this episode. I don't, I don't know that we're in the exact same place. We might be in one a similar thing. place, but I don't know that we're in the same place on this episode. I, I can share one thing, one uh -huh. gimme, and, and this, this will definitely come up in the discussion, but one of my all time favorite horror movie actors ever who lived yeah. is in this Absolutely. One. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's like, they just, they, they're like, okay, so we have this thing. Who are we going to get? And somebody went Robert England. <laughs> yeah. How about we get Willie and from V let's do that. Dude, when he, when he comes on screen for the very first time, okay, this is a YouTube thing. This is you guys watching. Yeah. All right. When he starts on screen and he starts talking about the hand and he does this, yeah. like it's the Freddy hand. He did the Freddy hand. <laughs> But and, how could he not at this point? That's who he was, right? you know? And, oh my gosh, I never realized just how short Freddy Krueger is. Yeah, that, it makes so much sense. When you understand that, you understand why he was such on such a murderous spree for demons all yeah, the time. Yeah, it was, you know, little man syndrome. Exactly. He's like, I might be little, but I got the... Right. Gonna, yeah. I might have my face all burnt up, but I'm gonna see you in your dreams, baby. I now want to go well, watch Freddy. Dude, I, I, they're some of my favorite movies. Yeah. Right around the time this episode came out, they did uh, Wes Craven's new nightmare. Right. Oh, was it really? kind of was like, yeah. the, it was like the meta one yeah, yeah. where like Freddy was real and Nancy Langenkamp yeah. was in her kid and ever Dylan was the kid's yeah. name. When I was going to my tech school in the Navy during our lunch breaks, we'd go to one of the, my classmates rooms and we'd watch movies. This was one of the ones we watched all the time. And then Ace Ventura, Pet Detective. Like those were our two go-tos. Mm. So good. This was, uh, uh, I remember watching the Freddy movies. I was sub 10 years old, eight, oh, nine years yeah. old, like younger than my kid is right now. I can't imagine my kid watching Freddy Krueger right now, right. Yeah. you know, but I, I remember watching Freddy three and I, at the older I got, I realized by about the time you hit Freddy three, Nightmare on Elm Street three, it went from horror flick to comedy comedy they, and action they turned yeah. into comedy hardcore like yeah there was a bit of gore there's a bit of whatever but it so this one and this two were scary YouTube. but after that they just weren't so so part three came out i think i think i was in middle school yeah. maybe or, or upper upper grade school yeah. and there's the scene there's the girl who has asthma uh -huh. and she falls asleep in class and he comes up yeah and he's, he grabs her. He's like, you want to suck face? And then he sticks his tongue out. Oh, my God. That, oh, that awful tongue. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, my God. But yeah. so I'm a, I'm a kid. And I'm like, that is the coolest. Th I, I <laughs> That's so cool. I would sit in front of my mirror just waggling my tongue out. <laughs> so that to this day, I can. I can totally Gene Simmons it. Wow. That's a thing for you two. Wow. That when I was a young person, I did that when I was, you know, I, it's been a long time since I do that in front of people, but well, you know, it's all because of Freddie. Hey, your wife's a lucky woman. So <laughs> I, I, I am truly the lucky one, but, but I'll tell you what I could do that when I was in high school and that was part. Of, yeah. Yeah. That's a whole, that's a whole other podcast. That's a whole other Jeff, podcast. This is a family friendly show, brother. It's a family friendly it's show. It's fun to waggle your tongue. That's 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 all all hey, it is listen, in the spirit of Gene Simmons. Listen, right? my kid waggles his tongue in his mouth all the time. He won't shut up. <laughs> anyway, um, okay, real quick before we get started, I just have to point it out. This is for the YouTube. This is YouTube exclusive. Jeff, you have a new shirt. I do. You have a new shirt. Battle crab shadows, whatever you want to call them. Battle crab. Yeah, we've seen people people have been calling it that in the spiders. comments. Spiders. I always thought the they were spiders, crab. but battle crab. Okay. I, yeah, you're right. People say that in the comments every once in a while. All right. Yeah, I thought this crab. was good. I got the Earth Force one that I can't wear that much anymore because yeah. they're total bad guys. Then I thought, well, if I just have bad guy shirts, that's the there you go. Cool. There you go. There you go. Hey, I got two pieces I want to show off in my background though. 
Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Totally. So these are cool. Let's. Hear, I'm gonna go with this one right here. All right. This is this is playing into the Star Trek piece. I don't know if you guys can tell. My Babylon Five ship from Wash is right there, uh, kind of covering it up. But right behind it is a painting my daughter did this week. It's objectively not a great painting, but you know what? <laughs> she did it, and I love it. And you know what it is, Jeff? It's I a give Star Trek painting. Delta. One Delta. She made her, she made her dad a Star Trek Delta. My little seven year old. That's so cool. You know, she's daddy. So I made cool. this for you, and I went. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a girl that knows her dad. Like, yeah, you know, and like put real effort. Like, there's yeah. is that like stars and stuff yeah. in the background. Yeah, and like, exactly. Yeah. And and there's the symbol in in the the middle. You know, like she she got a picture and did her best to copy it. And that's incredible. I love it. Absolutely love it. The other one that I was, that I was super, you know, I've been slowly collecting the uh, the figures, right? Um, I got John Sheridan around here somewhere, but currently I have Veer Cotto. Mm -hmm. He has made it, and I got Londo now in the collection. But my is he huh? does he have all the right uh, attributes? Well, he still has his vest on, so okay, can't tell. Uh, but then I also have my favorite character, Ivanova, and this particular one of Ivanova. I don't know if you can tell right there is signed. By Miss Claudia Christensen. How cool is that? That is so I'm cool. Excited. So I've also got, uh, I think I've got a Delenn over there somewhere now. I've got a John Sheridan. I'm missing Kosh. I'm missing Marcus. Who else am I? I? Do I have Garibaldi? I don't know if I have Garibaldi. I need to check. I'm missing Garibaldi. I think I'm missing Garibaldi. Who else do I need? I like, I need a list. I need a list. Right. Hey, if you guys have a list of. So the toys before you ask we've been warned um even up to this point there are action figures and toys out there of characters we have yet people haven't told us who they are but we've been told that there are spoilers in the other characters that there are action figures of so maybe not a list maybe a list up to season three maybe? no just just just, just give me that? the list and and we'll collect just them in right. time and you could even if you make the list you can mark don't get this one until after season four you can just tell me, okay. but I just, I just, I just need a list. Like, I want to know how close am I? Like, was this a set of like seven figures and I'm like right there? Or is this a set of like 32 figures and I got a ways right. to go? You know what I mean? Like that's kind of, that's kind of really where I am with it right now. Yeah. No. Bester, like I know Bester's out there somewhere. I'm sure there's a know. Bester figure. Yeah. Yeah. So might be a lead Alexander one. Probably. Probably. Maybe Naroon. Naroon would be cool. I don't know if they'd have a Ratama, whatever Ratama. other. Yeah, men, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Ooh, would Minbari they have, would they have been Mari Sinclair? Oh, Valen. We call Valen. him Valen. Oh yeah. Valen. There's a name for right, that. Right. Valen. Yeah. So, Hey, anyway, at least we're talking, we're eight minutes into this thing. At least we're talking about Babylon five, Jeff, let's get into Babylon five. We're talking about gray 17. Uh, the episode gray 17 is missing. And uh, we are going to be going through that. Jeff and I have just seen it for the very first time. We're about to record an audio podcast. You guys out there in YouTube land are watching our behind the scenes, how we record the episode, which means you get the unedited, unfiltered version because Jeff and I are too lazy to do anything with the video. We're just putting it up as it is. <laughs> And also it's more we frankly don't way. know what we're doing with video. I don't, it's, I don't know that <laughs> uh, I do. I just don't have time to do it. Um, but, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's more fun that way. Honestly, I think like, cause you get the outtakes, you get the bloopers, um, you get the places where Jeff and I completely screw up and <laughs> the rabbit trails and places that we go down. So with that, you guys sit back and enjoy, please comment down below, like subscribe. You guys know how YouTube works. We will do our best to respond to you in the comments. Um, and if we don't just please know that we still saw it and we still looked at it. Um, but there's a lot of comments out there. So Jeff, if you're ready, hit that magic button. First time. You're new here, or Someday, somewhere I'll make a difference. It's a mockery. I mean, we're not some, some deep space franchise. The station is about something. Here is 2023. The name of the podcast, Babylon 5, for the first time. Welcome to Babylon 5 for the first time. Not a Star Trek podcast. My name is Jeff Aiken, and I'm watching Babylon 5 for the first time. And I'm Brent Allen, and I'm also watching Babylon 5 for the very first time. Jeff and I are two veteran 
Star Trek podcasters watching Babylon 5 for the very first time. And in it, we are taking that analytical lens we have gained as Star Trek podcasters and we're applying it right here to Babylon 5 and also just determining how much we really like the series. And we are Star Trek podcasters, but this is a podcast about Babylon 5, not Star Trek. So to keep us honest, we play the rule of three. That means we each get up to and no more than three references to Star Trek apiece. That's it. Three. One of those plays. No substitutions, exchanges, a refund. <laughs> hey, Brett. Hey, Jeff. We have a five-star review. Oh, yes. This is off of Apple Podcasts, and I'm giving his name because he gave it in the review. His name is Tony. What's up, T-Man? Tony says, a podcast review for the first time. I started a new job a few months ago that brought with it a much longer commute. I figured it'd be a good time to find some podcasts to start listening to. In my search for a good sci-fi related one, I somehow stumbled on this one about one of my favorite shows ever, Babylon 5. I listened to Jeff and Brent's first episode last month and I was immediately hooked. It's been an absolute joy catching up and reliving this wonderfully complex show through them as they watch it for the first time. I appreciate that this is not a Star Trek podcast, but the hosts use that franchise as a springboard to compare and contrast the themes and structure of Babylon 5 while respectfully acknowledging that it is its own unique thing. With each episode they critique, they are finding the joy and the warts of the show that I made a point to follow every week almost 30 years ago. They love to make predictions about what the next episode will be about and where the storyline is headed. Sometimes I shake my head and laugh at how wrong they are or will be. But other times I get almost as giddy as my friend who danced on stage with Claudia Christian at a sci-fi convention many cycles ago when the hosts come really close in their predictions. It's a blast. Jeff and Brent keep up the excellent work and thank you for giving me and others like me something fun and worthwhile to listen to on my Monday commute to and from work. You know what, Jeff? Just for Tony, I want to give Tony's review its own. Oh, yeah. Hit that sweet button just for Tony. Oh, yes. Absolutely. That was a great review. Tony gets it. So many of you guys out there get it. A few don't. And that's okay. But Fine. Tony gets it, man, like to come in and, and, you know, Jeff, we had to defend this a lot back in like season two and some during here season three, but I think most of the people are really kind of settling in that, that, uh, you know, there's, it's not comparing it to star Trek. It's using the analytical lens. We gained to star Trek podcasters to talk about, uh, this show, but we also as much as we compare it to Star Trek, we also talk about Stargate and we talk about Battlestar Galacta and we talk about Star Wars and we talk about Princess Bride and we talk about what? three amigos. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Uh, we, we talk about everything, which Firefly, um, all of them. And it's, it's, uh, it, it uh, yeah, it's nice to hear that people understand because we still see people like, Oh, you can't compare this show to Star Trek. I'm like, and you know what, you know what I really love? Like I, I've, as uh, we've done this a couple of times, I think this season, like, like particularly when we get down to deltas and, and star furies, like we're, we're starting to ask the question. It's not just, okay, how star Trek is it? And then how much did we like the episode? But it's like, yeah, there's that message, but it did it in a Babylon five way. Like it's yeah. doing it in its own way. And I, I love getting into those types of conversations as well. Well, Brent, we have another five star review oh, yes this one's also from apple podcasts dwu 1989 says enjoying the ride jeff and brent bring their love of star trek to the world of babylon 5 as they enjoy the beloved show for the very first time it's a great listen as they try to tease the star trek out of the show and try to pick up on the plot threads that will carry through Highly recommend. 
Well, I am, uh, I'm going to go out on a limb DWU that you go to Dakota Wesleyan university. Whoa. Just going to throw it out there. I could be right. Okay. I'm probably right. I could be way wrong though. Dakota Wesleyan university. That's that's this, this person's a student or faculty or some other connection out there to it. Just guessing. They're the person, the person who graduated in 89. <laughs> they own that. Right. It's theirs. Right. Right. Well, listen, Brent, one of the cool things about our podcast, Babylon 5, for the first time, and the show itself, Babylon 5, is that it's set up in seasons, right? Mm -hmm. And at the end of each season, we like to look back and see all of the incredible things that we nailed, like Sinclair being Valen, and all the things that we missed. I really can't think of any because we kind of nail it. Anna Sheridan's being a space zombie. She's a space zombie. She's a Morden. No way. We'll get, yeah, it's going to happen. But we have this fun show every, at the end of each season where we do that. And in that show, we give away some super cool stuff. And this time around, we're giving away 3D printed star theories from our incredible friend, Wash, who on his own, out of the generosity and kindness of his heart, created. If you're on our YouTube channel, you can see Brent holding it up right now. Now he's got one, but we got two. So what you need to do is you need to review, go write a review for our podcast, take a screenshot of it, send it into us at Babylon five first at gmail.com or tag it on Twitter at mm -hmm. Babylon first, or frankly, we also see these. So if you just do the review, that'll, that'll do, but we are going to pick two people in that mm -hmm. wrap up to receive one of these star theories. Now I, I will say this, Jeff, while absolutely not necessary to win. It would not hurt your chances out there if you have already sent in a review because we're we're backdating this. Anyone who's ever done a review is eligible to win, right, Jeff? Hundred percent. Like this isn't just about getting new reviews. This is this is for honestly, Everybody. it's a way it's a way to reward those who took an extra step to shout out the show, right? So yeah. uh, at any point, if you uh, have sent in a review, that is enough to make you enter in, but. I'm just saying it couldn't hurt your chances to go take a screenshot and email it or tweet it to us anyway, no matter how long it's been out there. Just saying. So if you're on the fence, God, I like this show. It's pretty great. Or man, I hate this show and I just can't stop watching, you know, listening to see what they do. Yeah. Go write that review. You don't even have to give us a five star. It can be one. We got a couple one star reviews. We've got some twos, threes. We run the gamut. Yeah. Cool. We just love hearing from you, right? We It'd prefer be the awesome. five. I just want to be clear. We yeah. prefer the yeah. five. Like it's just like sending us the screenshots, not necessarily going to help your chances. Five-star reviews, not necessarily going to help your chances. But if you do happen hurt. to write a five-star review, you know what you do get? Oh, yes. Just like That's Tony. Working. Right? Exactly. Boom. Oh, it's been a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I just, you know, it felt like a good transition coming out of the, uh, the, the, the season wrap up giveaway hype. Hey, Jeff. Hey, Brent. You know, we love playing games here on the show. Lots of games, lots of games that we do. One of those games we like to do comes at the end of the show where we look at next week's episode. We try to guess what next week's episode is going to be. This is frankly one of the things we hear from our listeners out there about one of the things they love the most. I mean, even even uh, Tony in our review was like, I love listening to them predict what the next episode is going to be and what's going to happen because they're oftentimes hilariously wrong. And this is the part where we go back and look at what we predicted this episode was going to be last week and decide or just see how hilariously wrong we were. So Jeff, do you remember what you predicted gray 17 is missing was going to be about and how close were you? So I thought that gray 17 was going to be a, you know, a sector and they were a part of the gray sector that was going to be, they were going to fake that it was kind of destroyed or whatever. And oh, it's gone. It's missing. So they could repurpose it as a ranger training facility figured that with Sinclair being gone with all the strife on Minbar, mm. they were going to move it to Babylon five. I also thought that they were going to have this, uh, this, the facility be run by Marcus. So 
It was a ranger oriented episode that had nothing to do with the gray 17 piece. And Marcus was certainly in it. And we definitely touched on the strife from Minbar. So I, I get credit in, the, in, in, an in the spirit of sort of a sense, I think I'll give you half credit on that. Cool. You, you named the what did you think it was going to, well, I, I had one of two things is like you, I said that it was going to be a section of the ship that uh was missing like literally just gone um perhaps like blipping in and out like as a leftover effect from last week from from the from the the thing although that was babylon 4 not babylon 5 but still weird stuff happens you know somebody brought a time thing on and it, it made something weird it was gonna be something like that or i thought that gray 17 could be code for a secret agent like a gray council secret agent which until they reminded us in this episode that the gray council has actually been disbanded I was like, well, that's probably not it then. But that's what I thought. So I I got gray 17 and section is literally missing. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't blipping though. And there was absolutely no secret agent. So take it for what it, it is. A, it was a very apparent agent. Yes. There was no secrecy at all. Yes. Yes. Well, Jeff, for those of you. Well, Jeff, for those out there who are listening to us who haven't seen this episode in a while or maybe. They've never actually seen this episode and they're just listening to us anyway, which cool. Uh, why don't you tell the folks out there at home what this episode was actually about? Well, after all of the events of the last two episodes, which covers like a thousand years in story. So a little bit, a little bit happened in those. We're basically back to business as usual on Babylon five. Mm -hmm. They're all in, they're all in on the telepathic approach to taking down the shadows and are hosting an open casting call. They're putting ads on indeed and LinkedIn jobs, even buying a bunch of Facebook and Instagram ads. Everybody is applying for this thing, but it's exhausting work. So Sheridan and Ivanova decide to find Franklin and see if he still has his files on the underground railroad, you know, the ones he was apparently keeping on his main station computer. Whew. Well, he still has a backup of them, at least. He agrees to let Ivanova have them as long as they just leave me alone. <laughs> I said, leave me alone. Uh, I mean it, guys. I mean it. Stop talking to me. Well, to be fair, I mean, the show's not softballing this addiction thing, and he's going through some really tough withdrawals. So despite the, the voice there, Grace... Grace is offered. With Sinclair gone, like completely gone, I mean, they don't even say his name in this one. Like he's just Ranger One, Ranger One. But with him gone, they need a new Ranger One. And most people, or some people, want that to be Delenn. But in the time leading up to her ceremony to name her as Ranger One, Naroon shows up. We remember Naroon, right? Well, he accuses her of power mongering and low key threatens to kill her. So he and the warrior cast can have the Rangers just like they had a thousand years ago. And what a day all of this led to Marcus was assaulted after he challenged Naroon. Then someone got into the Ranger ceremony, which was Naroon after he beat down and maybe even killed Marcus, where Naroon ended up pledging his support to Delenn after much activity. He then visits Marcus in MedLab, and they connect, warrior to warrior. The ceremony was beautiful, though, even with the extracurricular violence. Jakar was even there, but no Kosh. Maybe, maybe this Kosh isn't wise to the Rangers, right? Also, there was no Marcus. At the ceremony, he was off fighting Naroon. That's the extracurricular violence. And there was no Garibaldi there either. Well, where was he? Well, first, there was this missing maintenance man. Only he wasn't missing. He was killed by a Zarg. But, but I'm getting ahead of myself. That was after Garibaldi found out that the entire 17th floor of Gray Sector had completely disappeared. Well, not disappeared exactly. This weird cult had taken over the place, see? And there was a dummy that shot tranquilizers out of its eyes. It was very strange, but it was all supposed to be perfect. 
That was the thing about it. And, and there wasn't a way out, but there was, except it was spiritual and you had to die a perfect death. That's where the Zarg came in and either it was going to kill me or kill Garibaldi or he was going to kill it. And am I going too fast for you? Cause I think that covers it. Brent, how did you first react to gray 17 is missing? Okay. So Jeff, I have a confession to make. Okay. Um, you know, we, we do our best to keep this show, not the show, but to keep us, you and me specifically spoiler free. Oh yeah. We work very like, hard. We try that. very hard. Sometimes it doesn't always happen. Sometimes stuff slips through the cracks. Now, I don't know if you've heard about this, but I heard not too terribly long ago that the episode titled gray 17 is missing. And the reason why that episode stuck out to me is because we have our friends over at the gray 17 podcast mm -hmm. who you know, for you and me, like, why did they name their show gray 17 podcast? I don't know. We'll probably find out. So I've, you know, that's kind of been keyed into my brain. Like I'm listening for what gray 17 is, you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which I have some questions for Scott still totally. after watching this episode, Scott, I love you. We got to talk, uh, <laughs> spoiler free, but <laughs> it's, <laughs> I just don't understand, but whatever. So I had heard that gray 17 is missing was actually considered a really bad episode. So bad. In fact, that JMS has apologized for it. What? Now I know I didn't know what for, I'm not sure if it was like the whole episode itself or just one aspect of it. Like I, like, I don't know, but what I knew, what I heard was gray 17 is missing is a bad episode in the middle of a lot of good stuff. And JMS was so embarrassed by it that he apologized for it. Really? So I came into this episode with expectations that were so low. That may be, I say that to say that may color everything I'm about to say. Okay. That's fair. I don't understand why JMS would have apologized for this episode. Oh, is this a top five episode or even a top 10 episode? No, but is it a bottom five episode? No. Is it a bottom 10 episode? Maybe, but there's only 22 episodes in a season. So you're talking 11 and 11 on top half and bottom half. And keep in mind that, that season three has been a really, really strong season. Yeah. You know, so could it find itself in the bottom half? Yeah, it could, but I don't, I don't think, I don't know that it's, that it was that bad. I think you take this episode and you place it in season two or season one, and it's easily a top half of the season type of an episode. Yeah. Um, the whole gray 17 thing, the, the namesake of this episode, the Zarg, the cult, I want to call it what it was. It was goofy and it was goofy as hell. It, it was just why, why is this here? you could have cut that part of the show out and the sh it wouldn't have made a difference to the rest of the episode. The part about the taking over the Rangers, the part about Naroon threatening to kill her. And then Marcus coming to defend. And then, um, uh, uh, Naroon having a face to face with Marcus in the hospital and that changing who Naroon was as a person that was so good. Yeah. And it was yeah. so masterfully done. So maybe I was just braced for this whole episode to be like really, really bad. And I found this episode rather compelling. Now I have been trained by star Trek and other 90 sci-fi shows to kind of, you sort of look over the bad a little bit, you know, and I know people are out there. Oh yeah. What about you do? Uh, okay. Listen, <laughs> you find the gold in, 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 in as much as you can. doesn't mean it's a great episode. But there was some stuff about this episode that I really liked and I found very, very compelling and enough to be like, I, I would absolutely watch this episode without, without fault. Like I would be like, oh yeah, this episode's on cool. You know, I like this episode. Um, this episode remind, and this may be getting a little bit too much into the other side of it, but this episode reminds me in many ways of the episode TKO from season one. Really? 
it's one plot is very compelling. The other plot is just stupid and goofy. I'm not sure that the two plots of this episode work together as a metaphor for each other, the way that it did back in TKO, but hear me out, Jeff, is there something about the cult being trapped in a level with no way out, but death being a metaphor for how Narun comes into this episode trapped by his own racism and his own superiority. And there's no way out from that, but death. And then there's, uh, in this case, we have Marcus whose loyalty and self-sacrifice and his honor as a warrior shakes Narun out of that complacency, like Garibaldi shook Jeremiah and all of those guys and found a way out that wasn't death and maybe gives, uh, am I reading too much into it? Absolutely. I probably am because I'm a Star Trek podcaster and that's what we do is we read way too much into stuff. Was this what JMS intended when he laid out this episode? Maybe, and maybe the reason he apologizes because the it wasn't as clear. You know, the fact mm-hmm. we saw him do it in TKO just means to me he's going to do it more than just once because that that those two plots in TKO were so masterfully woven together. Yeah, but well, we saw it in the second. I forget which episode, but there was an episode in the second season. I th- I think yeah. it was the second season that did the same thing. I, you're right. I I remember being an episode that did that, but it I don't remember which one it was. This might be that episode for the season. Maybe it didn't work as well, but I still thought that the episode was, was fine, good enough. And especially where my expectations were so low, I, I liked it better than I thought I would. Jeff, how about you? So I, one of the first thoughts I have is throughout our journey on Babylon five, we have sparked tremendous debate around our viewing order. Right, mm-hmm. people have a lot of feelings on viewing order. Sure, John Krikorian with the Trek Profiles podcast gave us his definitive viewing order list. We committed before day one that this is how we're going to watch the show, right. and time and time again, we we have defended that point. And I am so thankful that's what we did here, yeah, because the um. I don't know which viewing order, but the viewing order many people were recommending was War Without End 1, War Without End 2, Walkabout, Gray 17 is missing. I think having Walkabout before the WWE episodes made a ton of sense with the new Kosh and the stuff or whatever, and then slide us into this big thing. The thing is, if we had watched the WWE episodes and then come into Walkabout and then come into Gray 17, we liked Walkabout, right? It was okay. Mm -hmm. This it's okay. Yeah. It's got, this has some serious high point. I mean, I loved everything about the Minbari and Ranger stuff that happened, but to have done walkabout in this together would have been a serious letdown after war without end. Now I say that we haven't seen the next episode. So, you know, maybe it may still be in for that, that ride, but I don't think that's the case. That cult stuff. I, I want desperately to believe what you're saying because then it makes it mean something. Yeah. It was so bad. And I and I felt bad for Robert England. I love Robert yeah. England. He's so good. And people know him as Freddy Krueger, yeah, right? Just right? hilarious and snarky and evil and all this stuff. What I am 100% sure members of our community out there remember Robert England from is being Willie in V. The the kind hearted innocent visitor who came and joined with the resistance and then helped support the fifth column, he was great in that. But he had this uh, this timidity that we never saw in Freddy Krueger mm-hmm. that really shone through in in his Jeremiah character. Um, I thought it was great. I thought he was good for what he was supposed to be. Um, kind of arch, kind of over the top. But also, I felt like that was sort of the tenor they were going for a little bit. Mm -hmm. But it didn't make any sense. The Zarg was one. I think that the the, the big organic tech monster in Infection looked more believable and menacing than this Zarg. (laughs) That thing was, hey, do we have some random rubber laying around that we can just slap on a dude? What? No, you know, you know, I mean, okay. The, the seasons of Babylon five are supposed to be like in order of a year. Like they go like from January to December. Right. Yeah. And so this late in the year, we've got to be around like Halloween. Right. So those spirit Halloween stores are open. (laughs) 
You know, you just go down yeah. to local spirit Halloween, grab you a costume. Here we go. Screen, you know they've got one on the Zocalo. Screen yeah. Screen ready. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> that helps everything make more sense. But uh, I liked the Franklin, uh, the fact that Franklin is actually experiencing like withdrawals yeah. and and so I, I liked that. Um, but but Brent, I loved. I loved the Minbari stuff in this and Naroon. I've, I've got a lot. I, I got a lot to talk about Naroon when we dive into this. It was, it was really, that was really well done. That, that whole piece. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, again, I don't know what JMS was apologizing for. Maybe he was apologizing for the Zarg. Like <laughs> he should, he know? should <laughs> fine. You know, and, and like I said, I, like, or for the stupid gun. I'm sorry. Let's, let's just go there. Right. The sto- the, mm. So in, in the, early in the episode, yeah. right, when Garibaldi and Zach are hanging out, which, by the way, how cool is it that Garibaldi and Zach are cool again? Right, right. Yeah. You know I you like know what that. I need to complete that? I need Lou. Remember Lou? Lou. Whatever happened to Lou? I think he got replaced by Zach. Yeah. <laughs> he got recast. <laughs> he's probably looking around and he's just like, this, this, things aren't going to go well here. Right. He's on, he's I'm on, out. you know what it is? He's on Delta Shift. Right. Yep. <laughs> Babylon 5. Oh. Previously on Babylon 5. Let me get myself a clean one of those. I hit the... <laughs> Just like the maintenance guy who got pulled down, who had a prototype version of the Roadcaster Pro. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm having a hard time hitting the right buttons over here. Okay, let, we, let's talk about that. Okay, let, okay, let's talk about the Colt. Let's talk about the Gray 17 piece and then be done with it because the real meat of this really Just, is over in the room. Yeah. Okay. The dude sitting there in this little shaft going, um, I can't find any electrical thing. Oh, look, there it is. About that time, maybe a minute before that, or, or just a, a few seconds before, I saw the name, Robert England. Yep, and yeah, I, it was and right then, there and overdue. this thing happened, and I went, this is a horror episode. This is, and you know how sci-fi does horror, Jeff. Yeah, yeah. It's not good. No. It's never good. So I was ready for it. I was... I was the whole thing. I was like, let's go. Let's I'm, I'm here for it. Let's, let's just, let's get stupid with this. Let's go. And boy, and when it sucked him down, I was like, this is Freddy Krueger. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. It was so long before we got back down here to the gray 17 stuff. Now the pistol thing, I 100% hear what you're saying about the pistol thing from a narrative standpoint, you had to have that. So he could have the bullets later. Well, that's all it, it I was. thought it was cool. Yeah. We last week we talked a lot about subverting expectations. And I like when they're playing with the rifle, the what do they call it? A slug, slug thrower. Yeah. Or something they called it. I'm like, oh, we have a literal checkoffs gun right, right. here. Right. Like, look what we're playing with. But no, no, they went a whole different route. It was checkoffs ammo. <laughs> right. Whereas like I've I just happen to have a couple loose bullets yeah, here in my and pocket. I can turn them into actual bullets with hammer and steam pipes yeah. or whatever. So you cannot do that. No. When when Captain Kirk was on Cestus Three fighting a Gorn in arena, he got gunpowder and he got it to, into a little bamboo shoot and he blasted Gorn in the face. <laughs> Highly effective, right? This Except was it just blown a up steam- in his face in real life. But go ahead. But this, that's what would have happened with this. Yeah. It was a steam pipe. So he throws throws these bullets in the steam pipe and then holds it up. Do you know, let me, let me, I know you know this, but for our listeners out there, let me just take you down a short little physics lesson. When <laughs> super hot steam pushes from the back end of a tube or a pipe, it superheats the first thing it touches, which is the bullet that's in the back. So either it blows up in the tube and blasts Garibaldi's face into oblivion, or it shoots all the bullets out at once. And actually, none of those things would happen because that steam didn't have the pressure nor the temperature to push a bullet. That was the that was the dumbest put together. That was, I mean, that, costume aside, Brent. That that oh my, Jeff, you're, what Jeff? You're really? not you're not wrong. But at what point did you look at that and go, "This is serious right now." I'll, I'll you saw, you heard, serious. you saw Robert England is in this, is in this, this episode. You mm-hmm. saw dude sitting in the little man trap thing or the little manhole thing and get sucked down. At what point did you think this was going to be serious? Like at some point you just got, look, I'm going to go get some popcorn and we're going to embrace the cheese, man. Let's just right, go. Right. I'm going to go with them. 
And by the way, the other half of that episode was just amazing. Okay, so he gets pulled down. They, Jeff, I freaked out. It was it was my favorite part of the whole episode. It's the first time we meet Jeremiah, Robert England, right? Mm -hmm. And he's there in the pulpit, and he's talking, and he he's starting to to, to monologue, and he's not making any sense whatsoever no. the way a cult leader does. And and guys, if you're an audio listener to this show, I beg you. Please go to the YouTube channel, go to our video on this week and go to the 40 minute and 25 second spot of this video because I'm going to shit. Robert England leans in and he holds his hand up and he just puts his hand in that position and it's the Freddy hand. Totally. Like I could see totally. the knives coming out and he just, and he looks at it and it's the hand. I lost it because it's Freddy Krueger and Oh my God. It was so good. It was so good. And he made no sense. And then Garibaldi and, and he, you know, gray 17 is missing. Gray 17 didn't look like it was missing. It went 16 double floor down. And then the next, when it opened, it didn't say 18. It said 17, it said 17. I think. Right. So gray yeah. 17 was there. It said 17 yeah. on both floors. Yeah. So there's 16, 17, 17. Yeah. Someone just rigged it so that the went past the first 17. Yeah. What? Right. What? Yeah, the, none of that made sense. Jeff, none of that made sense. And and here's the thing. I didn't care. <laughs> I just didn't care. I was I was in it for the B-rated horror film that this was okay. in that part. You get that dummy that comes in and turns and starts talking and then it shoots you in a dart. Jeff, I hope. I hope to God that JMS has a, a, a credit, a writing credit, a producing credit, uh, a story inspired by for every single saw film that is out there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because that thing was the origin of jigsaw. Totally. Yeah. With the eye, I mean the eye. Absolutely. And the, the, that, oh yeah. my gosh, that thing was so creepy. Ew. And, and you're right. You get to the Zarg and yeah, we're cults. We're going to go be eaten by the Zarg and we're just going to give ourselves up to the Zarg and he's going to do some stupid whatever to kill the Zarg. Turns out you just got to shoot him with a bullet and it only has to hit once. And then they're going to go take his pulse. And it was just, it was so awful, but it was, it was just so fun. Like I don't, Here, I can't, well, I, I can't blame it. Like. And I can't, but here's me not, not letting, I can't, I can't suspend my disbelief that, I mean, I can't, I, Jeremiah totally suspended my disbelief. Nothing he did made sense or was whatever, but it was perfect for that character. Sure. Right. Like I got it. Yeah. Anglin nailed it. All of his followers looking at him, nodding on, you know, the whole thing. Great. Awesome. All in for that. Here's where it all falls apart for me though. Once we know about the Zarg. I'm like, okay, so the Zarg can reach up and pull maintenance dude down through the little manhole thing or whatever. Why can't he take two inches further and just climb out right. and just be in the station? Right. <laughs> like, pfft. why is he staying on that level? Well, what? because he keeps getting fed by the cult folks down there in the bottom, uh, you know? I guess. And why does he got to go? His food supply is right there. Right it's there. like, wow. Right there. But you know, some cool stuff though. I noticed when Garibaldi went down uh -huh. from the 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 tranquilizer jigsaw guy, yep. was there these old newspapers stacked up? Some old Universe Today's. Did you see those? I did not. So I went down. I paused the second time I watched it. I paused on it yep. to look. So there was one stack that was on the the screen left that said um, Santiago reelected. So these are newspapers that would have come in early season one. Okay. Right? I forget if that wasn't midnight on the firing line that he was elected, but right after maybe. And then just next to Garibaldi's head on, on screen, right. Uh, there was a stack that said, um, new captain appointed to Babylon five. So that would have been right at the top of season two. Okay. So Jeremiah talked about like have being into the, the recycling stuff so they could you know, probably handle their waste and get some food yeah. and whatever. But like, there's also some mechanism where they're, you know, getting news and probably gear and stuff like yeah. that too. It's me just trying to piece together. Yeah, like what in sense. this makes any none level of, of sense. sense. None of it made sense, but that's the thing. Like, but I did, but I didn't care. I didn't care because it was uh, honestly, the other half of the episode was so compelling that I was like, whatever, like they should have named it something. They should have named it. There's a new ranger one in town 
Yeah, and something. It would have. Yeah, exactly. The rest of this would. You would have just written it off as a stupid B plot, not even thought yeah, about. Yeah, and, and that's all fine. And I loved. I mean, I stole almost word for word for my recap what Garibaldi said when he sat down to tell Sheridan what happened. Uh -huh. And like, in my head, I'm like, oh, that was stupid. Garibaldi's line delivery of that whole thing makes it all worthwhile. <laughs> right. That was great. Right. Um, okay. Just a couple of things that I thought was kind of funny. Uh, first of all, dude's calm. The, the maintenance dude's calm is a pin. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like, I have my little mechanical pencil here and I'm talking into my mechanical pencil and that's oh, my communicator. That. Oh yeah. It was, really? it was like, they, it's like they went to go shoot the, the, the episode and they're like, wait, we can't find that prop. We can't find that prop. And somebody's like, here, use this. Just, just, just use this. It's fine. Nobody will know. Nobody will know. Um, I love that. Uh, the, oh, uh, 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 to go back to the, to the, the floor, the missing floor, mm -hmm. gray 17 is a, is a floor. Um, so it literally was a state, a section of the station that was quote unquote missing that. Okay. Listen, uh, it, it's missing. Like the chamber of secrets is missing. People know it's there. You have to, yeah. you can't be that stupid about it. Okay. But here's the thing. This is a true story. Did you know that in South Korea, buildings do not have a fourth floor? A fourth floor? A fourth floor. Mm -mm. You get into an elevator. There's the lobby. There's the second floor. There's the third floor. There's the fifth floor. Sixth floor, seventh floor, all the way up. Okay. They do not have a fourth floor because the number four in Korea is considered bad luck. So nobody goes onto the fourth floor. So they don't have a fourth floor. So like many buildings here in the States that don't have a 13th floor. But still, totally. I mean, if you're on the 14th floor, you know what's up. Yeah. And and I mean, and that's the thing. Like, I'm not going to say that you're going to ever go into a building and it's not going to have a fourth floor, but there's no fourth floor. Yeah. Like it just it just doesn't exist. So hmm. that that just reminded me. And I know that having lived there. So right? that was yeah. that's that's firsthand information, not I read it somewhere on Facebook. What were your thoughts on Franklin and that whole scene with Ivanova trying to get yeah. the, the files from him? I, I, well, you know, you said it was so good to kind of actually see him like going through the DTs on this, mm -hmm. you know, the detox. I mean, and whatever. it wasn't good, right? To be clear, but I just, it's a, it's a mid nineties no, and there's softball and stuff. I'm, like this I'm glad then. that they showed him going through it because yeah. when he went on walkabout and he was not going through it, it kind of upset me. Same, you know, uh, and, and they even, they even gave you a reason why. They said, hey, listen, it takes a while for stems to get out of your system. It just takes an extra extra bit of time. I was like, okay, cool. At least you address it. Yeah. Um, that part was fine. I, I wasn't sure. They could have written around that. They didn't need to have Stephen Biggs come in to do this one little scene for that week. I like, did, was, it, was it a quark thing where he just shows up out of contractual obligation? Maybe, you know, like, dude, we got to pay you so much. Yeah. So get in the makeup um, chair. I mean, but it, it was a, it was a relatively small part of the episode. It mm -hmm. made sense. The idea that they are trying to gear up for the shadow war by, by contacting, uh, these, these telepaths and bringing them back to the station, bringing back the idea of the underground railroad that used to run through the station. Um, I, I liked that part of the episode just on a continuity level. You know what I just thought when you were saying that? I don't remember dude's name, but the the telepath that was buddies with Jason Ironheart that kind of led, yeah, you know, the led dude from the, like uh, Switzerland the, or whatever. Yeah, uh, yeah, with the accent yeah. and everything. That's the he has that very yeah. very unique look. We're this is we're, we're going to see him again. This is my this is my longer term prediction. We're going to see him again, and he and Bester are going to have to work together to go accomplish a thing against the shadows. There's going to be an episode with the two of them, like having to get through their stuff. I look, for, I, I very much look forward to those two coming together. I hope that happens. I do not think that will happen, but if it does, I'm for it. I'm all like, cause it, it's a, it's a great narrative piece, which you just don't crush about. my dreams, Brent. It, don't crush just, them. I have so few yeah. left. That's one of those things. Jeff, people are out there like, well, I guess you're going to be disappointed or they're like, Oh my God, he just nailed it. You know, um, it's, I like sci-fi from the nineties. I'm used to disappointment. It's fine. Go. I can, <laughs> I go. want things. It's uh, to go back to the, to the Franklin thing. You referenced it a little bit in your, uh, in your recap, but 
he kept his files on the main computer oh my God. on what his work heck? computer. I, what did you label it under here? Illegal stuff that I'm involved in. Is it on there? But did you catch the code name of the file that was for great. the underground was railroad? Great. The code name is Harriet. Yeah, that, that was, was cool. awesome. Well, one, it was awesome, but also it's literally the same as being like, oh, don't go into my tax documents file. There's nothing, there's nothing there, mom, that you need to see. <laughs> Why is your tax document file one and a half terabytes? What's in there? <laughs> <laughs> you got some videos. Um, yeah. But I mean, and for those of you out there who are like, I don't know, or maybe you are not from the United States and you don't understand this particular part of our history. Um, back when the awful, awful, awful thing of slavery was around and existed 150 years ago now ish, Jeff, yeah, somewhere around there, there was a lady named Harriet Tubman, who was a former slave who escaped to freedom, but she continually came back into slave states to help lead, uh, current slaves to freedom in the North and using a thing called an underground railroad. So the fact is underground railroad, the file name was Harriet, Harriet Tubman, uh, that's the connection. And, and I just, it was a cool, you know, like they didn't, they didn't shine this big bright spotlight on it, but it, it was, it was a neat little connection. I liked it. I yeah, if you it. didn't know, you just be like, Oh, okay. It's the name of the file. If you know, you're like, that is beautiful. Yeah. That is awesome. Yeah. Well, well done JMS for writing that in, um, Garibaldi in the elevator mm -hmm. when he's going through and he's doing the little counting thing. I thought that was a brilliant way of doing it. I never would have thought to do that. And honestly, I don't care, but you're telling me nobody riding that elevator was like, Huh. It's just a little bit longer between 16 and uh, 17. Like well, that, and, that and there's a piece to takes longer former military. And, and, and again, I'm only speaking from my experience, but like when you're on a boat and in a way Babylon five is a ship, yeah. you know, it's out there in space or space or whatever. It's a it, space. It's one of the things I loved. One of the reasons I chose to serve on a submarine. It's the closest thing we can get to a spaceship, you know, sure. that's out doing stuff, but you know, everything about that. I mean, it doesn't matter what your job is, you know, all the levels, you know, where all the valves are, you know, where all this stuff is, it's just part of the job. And, oh, we, oh, they messed up. I mean, it says 20, 20 decks, but there's only 19. What about the other sectors? Are they missing a floor? Cause like, right. why only this one? And like, again, it just, I think to your point, it can be a whole lot of fun as long mm -hmm. as you don't think, I mean, don't even start almost thinking about anything then that whole thing can be fun just just go with it just just go with it freaking go with it um, with franklin yeah. he kept he he went back to talking about his walkabout you know mm. i gotta finish yeah, yeah. my walkabout i just gotta find myself sit down yeah. wasn't that the point of the singer lady like wasn't that like the visualization that's, of his walkabout? that's what i thought it was I 100% yeah. thought that that was, and then he skulks off after, after the episode. I, by the way, you, you said this earlier, um, talking about the, the viewing order. I 100% get why people would want you to put walkabout in and then gray 17 is missing just for that one little connection, mm -hmm. because it, it makes the time go by a, a little bit easier. I actually appreciated the, the diff, the distance. Because same, it made same. it, it made it feel like his walkabout was actually taking a very long time. Mm -hmm. you it's know? happening, and, right? And I don't, I don't know how the timeline of the station overlaps with all of this, but it, it, it allowed that to sit into it. It, it made it feel better to me. So, yeah, I just because because our community would expect me to, you know, feel some sorrow and sympathy for him in his in his detox time and whatever, just to prove that I have none and I still don't like. Dr. Franklin at all. Brent, this was serious narcissist behavior from him, like wildly toxic, wildly unhealthy. Like he's going to throw that kind of fit for, for one, for a friend needing help just to give out critical information that could literally save the universe. Possibly, you know, yeah. it's like, Hey, I need this thing, buddy, that can save billions. Well, I don't feel good. Yeah. And, and also the fact that, like this is all for information from him running a wildly illegal operation that Sheridan and Ivanova were like, Hey dude, it's cool. It's like they gave him a pass mm -hmm. 
and now he's getting all up in their stuff for ads. I don't know. I just yeah. mm, people desperately want me. I don't, I don't even know if they want me to like Look, Franklin. I think what they want me to do is admit I'm wrong. But he keeps proving I'm yeah, right. The only the only thing that I could do to play devil's advocate and come to Stephen's defense here is one: when you're going through DTs like that, you're not nice. You don't really know what you're saying or or care. You know, you're just kind of in your own thing. The other thing that I will say is, is from a narrative standpoint, a production standpoint, this also could be the, Hey, here's why you're not going to see him for an episode or two, because he just told you get out of my face, you Mm -hmm. know, and he's off making a movie or his wife just had a baby and he's taking some time off of the show or whatever, whatever reason he's not like in the main part of the show. They just gave you the reason for him to not be there. Yeah, that makes sense. So, um, I think we got to talk about Narun and Delin and that whole situation is because frankly, that was the meat of this episode. Yeah. This is the show right here. Um, so Narun comes in and, and actually one of the first things that I noted when he came in and he talked to Delin was it confirmed that the gray council is completely disbanded, which honestly I had both forgotten about and i wasn't sure if the actions actually meant there is no more gray council yeah i remembered it had happened but i was like it it happened right they walked out and we haven't gotten any follow-up because she said disband the council and follow me and like like half of them followed and one person grabbed somebody else's shoulder and they're like Mm -hmm. get away from me and they they went on so you know this is a confirmation that yes that happened there is no more gray council what does this mean for the government of Minbar? This has been a while now. Yeah. So what's going on? Is there a civil war brewing between the cast? They they seeded that possibility in this episode. Mm-hmm. That if something happens, this could erupt in a civil war on Minbar. Oh my gosh. What an awful time to have a civil war come to Minbar. <laughs> yeah. Right? Um, also, the need for a new Valen. Yeah. Which is apparently Delenn. Uh, or David, I'm not going to let it go. Like, Oh they, yeah. They, you, yeah. Yeah. You yeah. don't drop the kid and the kid's name without him having some sort of a destiny. Right. Right. Um, Narun had this line though, that I just found absolutely disgusting. He said, t- just one, just one. Well, <laughs> but it's the one that I wrote down. He said, he, talking of specifically about the Rangers, but he's talking about Minbar society as a whole at the same time. He said to dilute their purity by allowing the humans to enter in or mix in or whatever his exact Mm -hmm. word was. I was like, wow. Wow. It lines up with what he was saying when he kicked Delenn off the council. Sure. Just the, uh, you know, I I remember my comments around that were all around like dudes, all racial purity. Yeah. Like that's his thing. But I think not, not to go to the end of that yet though, but I think it makes the end of this hit that much harder that they had him be so explicit about sure. it in this episode again. Sure. And I mean, and it's backed up. There was an episode back in season two. I don't remember the name of it, but, uh, where we like Sheridan was set up as, as a dude who killed somebody. And there was one of yeah. the nearest own cast mates or the house, the third house of Chudomo. Chudomo. Yeah. His, mm-hmm. his Chudomo mate was like the guy and, and he was just like, I'm not even recognizing Dylan as a person anymore, Yeah, you know? And, and so that this has certainly been established that this is something about Mimbari, uh, uh, culture. One thing they also said was no Mimbari has killed, killed another in over a thousand years. Well, that immediately now tells us Sinclair Valen, since he became a thing, no Mimbari has killed each other without a great council, which has also existed for the last thousand years. Yeah. I mean, Jeff, are we looking at the press? Are we standing on the precipice of a Mimbari civil war, despite what happened at the end of this episode? I, I, I don't know if it's a civil war, but I think it's definitely a collapse of their known society. Mm-hmm. So I, we can assume that Valen went back or Sinclair went back and then as Valen reformed Minbari society. Mm-hmm. And so that time his reformation of that society is, is dead. It's dying. We're watching it die. Right. And so I, and I think part of, I think part of the conclusion of the series is going to be the reform, like the, the re reformation, mm-hmm. you know? So yep. from, I think from this point forward, 
maybe not civil war, but definitely civil strife. Yeah. Um, by the way, I, I just, it, particularly in this episode, I can't hear the word Rangers getting the Rangers together. I can't hear that word without thinking power Rangers. I go, go power I never Rangers. Watched, yeah. I never watched power Rangers, but I felt the same. I'm just like, it, it bothered me that they kept saying Ranger one and uh -huh. not until the, yeah. because Ranger one is such a human thing to say, sure. you know? And it's like, just does your word. Does Intel Zob mean Ranger one? I think so. I think like if you translate it, I think that's supposed to mean Ranger One. I still have questions if there's some sort of weird connect to the idea of Zaha Doom and and whatever. Yeah. But well, I uh, I did yeah. go to Google Translate and I said, "What does Intilza mean in English?" And it just called me a nerd. <laughs> so <that's, laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> um. Hey, let me ask you. Do you think Narun was right though in his concern? About about Delenn. about Delenn using the Rangers to consolidate her power. She's a powerful leader of the religious caste, despite everything else that's happened with her. And now she wants to control this this military arm. Like that, I mean, put yourself in Narun's shoes. Like this isn't just him looking to grab power. Like there's a little bit of like a, hey, wait a minute. Let me read you my exact note. Yeah, Narun thinks she's empire building. I can see where he would think that, and I'm not sure he's wrong. I don't know that she's doing it intentionally. Yep. But but also, I don't think that Delenn does things unintentionally. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's like, I, let, me, let me rephrase it. I don't think she's doing it maliciously. Yep. But I think there may be some undercurrent political intent behind what she's doing. Well, but also for Delenn. Okay, think about what she now knows coming off of War Without End, parts one and two. Mm -hmm. She is the one, and she yeah. is the one now. Who is? Who is? Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. And if mm -hmm. she is going to be the one, then yeah, she has. That's a that's a clear, open and shut. Then I'm the one to lead. I mean, and and we've seen Delenn do this. You know, hey, here's this prophecy, and somebody's got to do it. Well, it's gonna be me. Oh, hey, yeah. you're the one. Well, I guess I'm leading the Rangers then. Well, hey, you're the one. Well, I'm I'm going to hook up with Sheridan, I guess, and we're going to have babies. By the way, did you note just how much more chummier Sheridan was with uh, Delenn after going to the future yeah. and seeing where they wind up together? I found it fascinating because I talked last week about that first kiss being kind of, kind of uh, upsetting to me because uh -huh. it was a first kiss but not a first kiss or whatever. But then I thought... It's going to be not fair again because when they actually have their kind of for real first kiss, it'll be his second kiss. Mm. Like they as a couple yeah. have been robbed of a true first kiss. Mm. And if this was created by Disney, that would have massive implications. Well, Delenn would be asleep for, or D Sheridan would just be asleep. Sheridan, forever. yeah, he's the princess. Yeah. He is the princess in this story. I, I, I think for sure. There you go. Um, but I thought it was great because like they were watching everybody go through and I mean, he's just high school arm around her and leaning. Oh in. yeah. And she's putting her head on her shoulder. Uh -huh. and yeah. It was so and... sweet, but it was cool. They connected. And I really, I was touched by her story about her, like, especially about her dad mm -hmm. when she shared that story about her dad. Um, so the story is that, you know, there was a tradition that when they went to temple, he would carry her up on his shoulders and they would go in, and one day he looked at her and said, you're too big to go on my shoulders. And I don't know, a couple months ago, you and I were talking about our daughters. Our daughters are close in age. Yep. And um, and like my, my daughter, she's very tall, but she is, is a very, very light child. Mm -hmm. And so I can, still, I can still pick her up and carry her. Not easily, but I can. And it's a pretty normal thing. Like at the end of the day, well, she'll stand at the foot of the stairs, and she wants an uppy. Yep. And I will go out of my way to make sure I can give her that uppy because I know that one day I won't be able to, like there's going to be a last time I pick up my daughter yeah. and I'm not going to know when that time is, you know, until after it has happened. Mm -hmm. It's almost like Andy, Andy Bernard in the office when he says, wouldn't it be cool if when you're in the good old days, you knew you were in the good old days. Right. And I feel like that's picking up your kid, but I loved how she added that piece that when he said that, you know, you're too big, I can't carry you anymore. And she's like, I looked at him and for the first time I knew that I was going to lose him one day 
And I loved him more than I ever had before. Right. Because as we would say, he became more human in that moment. Mm-hmm. I kept waiting for her to say, you know, he became more Minbar to me in that moment. But uh, I thought that I just, I, I, I really liked that story. I thought that was great. So Lanier goes to Marcus because he's been given an order and he can't, he can't do some stuff. I loved his reasoning for going to Marcus. <laughs> like he's, but I, man, I am loving Lanier more and more. Like, cause he, he knew he had to do something mm-hmm. and he figured something out of, of what he had to go do. And, and I loved that he made something happen. Um, but I want to talk about the Naroon Marcus fight. Yeah. Okay. First of all, the set design, it was a simple, easy set. Now I say that mm-hmm. as a person who doesn't build sets, but it was a simple, easy set. The lighting for that set was amazing coming through the fan with the fan rotating like that and what that did, uh, what that allowed the the cinematographer to do and for the directors and all like, it was a beautifully done set. And, uh, I absolutely, I loved that whole scene, that whole part. It was very, um, very empire strikes back, right? When Luke and Vader are in, they're still, when they're still in cloud city, fighting before they get to the outside. It had that feel too. And the fight had that feel too. I think this is one of those moments we've talked about the evolution of Babylon fives, um, production value. Mm -hmm. They could not have done this scene in the first season at all. Second season would have been okay. Like this, this scene could only happen for them now Mm -hmm. the way that it did. And I think because of the set design, the lighting and, and, and just the, they were able to get these nice wide shots, nice these really nice close up shots, and it allowed for an edit that really made it look like the Naroon and Marcus actors were like there was no obvious stunt fighting mm-hmm. happening. You know, even today, in a lot of stuff when they're having a fight scene, it's like oh, there's the stunt actor doing the thing, and right. this was cut together so smoothly. There were times I wondered, I'm like, did they do all of this themselves? Like. Oh, really I, well you done. know, I, I 100% believe that that was the, the actors for Marcus and Narun doing all of those pieces. I will say though, that I do as much as I loved the set, the fight choreography though, I often felt like I was watching fight choreography and not watching a fight. And many There's times one... like, I couldn't tell who was actually attacking whom. Yeah. Like I just didn't well, know. They just they they look like they were going through motions they've practiced fifteen mm-hmm. times before. And they had similar outfits, yeah, um, which helped cover some of that. But there was one scene in particular. Naroon's getting the upper hand, and Marcus ends up on his knees facing a wall. Uh-huh. And what's supposed to happen is my guess is Naroon comes down for that death blow to the back of his head, and boom, he gets his pike up. But what happened instead is he got his pike up. And then Naroon hit his down pike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it was just yeah. like, like, there's no way that arc of attack would have ever even hit him. Right. But, like, so but it, I mean, come on. Right. It, we talk about, I talk about how I can't suspend disbelief for your gray 17 stuff. Just come on, Brent, suspend your disbelief for this. Oh, no, I suspended great. my disbelief, but I was still like, uh, but hey, you know what? For a fight like that on mid 90s television, not bad. Not bad. Not bad. I couldn't have done better. Um, Okay, I don't know if you've ever heard the saying before that uh, Marcus the Ranger spoke while he was in the middle of his fight. I don't think I've ever heard it. Yeah. I don't think, but he's there's two pieces that jumped out to me. One, I stand on the bridge and none may pass. You shall not pass. We've heard about JMS's love of Tolkien. Yeah. Like that's I, 100%. 100%. Bloop. Yep. Yeah, rip right. But then he says this, and this means something different after last week. We live for the one, we die for the one. And right now, the one is Delenn. Mm-hmm. Live for the one, die for the one. And I wrote that down, and turns out that would be the crux for the rest of the episode. Yeah, weird, right? Brilliant writing, Jeff. You say it was brilliant, right? It was 
And 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 the acting for it too is so good. I think because yeah. I think Naroon Naroon did such. Well, I forget the actor's name, and I feel like a jerk for forgetting his name because he's so good. Mm-hmm. But what he brought to that character was that inner strife. Like during that fight, he, you you brought TKO up earlier, so I'm going to bring it up again. Where mm-hmm. I, I really have this strong belief because of my professional background that like martial arts combat fighting is such a great way to express inner not inter but inner personal turmoil and conflict Mm -hmm. and that's what this fight was right what we saw was marcus is truly a ranger and fully believes in the one like without question and that's great cool we kind of assumed that but now we have it confirmed he was fully willing to die but naroon yeah, whatever. I, I can win this fight whenever I want. Boom, broke sure. one of your ribs. Boom, two. Come on, dude, just give up. I can make this easy for you. The reason he didn't just kill Marcus is because he knew there was more going on. And he felt personally, and we'll talk about it, you know, when we get to our closing thoughts specifically, but his ability, the actor's ability to show that facially through the fight was incredible. Mm-hmm. And to me, that last scene was, you know, Marcus flayed out blood clearly on his last moment. And he had that shot of Naroon with the pike, right, right, right at him. And if he was going to kill him, the last, the end of that scene would have been boom, you know, the pike boom, coming towards the camera. I wish that that scene had happened. Mm. Right. But we found that it was him just, you know, moving it away. I think it would have added a little more punch to when he walked into the, into the ceremony, but God, it was just, they told such a story in that fight mm-hmm. that, that to me, that's part of what forgave some of the, so, the not so great choreography. So to go back to the idea of a, an impending civil war with what comes next. Okay. Um, d- despite the laughter we heard at the end between Naroon and Marcus, Naroon comes in and he declares Delenn in Tilza. He does. Right. But at the same time, and he says that line, they would die for you, but they wouldn't die for me. Like amazing line, but he throws the pike down on the ground and it's covered with blood. And he says, there are, there's now blood between our casts and there's blood between the warrior cast and the humans. Did that resolve at the end of this episode? Or is that something we're going to pick up? in a future episode or set of episodes coming up here soon. So I have a theory. I want to hear it. So there was um, the episode, and I'll talk about it in my closing thoughts as well, but we met Naroon in Legacies. Okay. And Legacies. Because he was doing was, that thing with the, he was taking somebody's body on a tour, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And it, the the big, I, I forget his name, but the, the person was a friend of Delenn's. Yeah. And it was the big military commander during the Earth Minbari War yep. who was religious cast. But switched, you know, and went and worked. I'm not. I don't know if he switched to warrior cast, but he basically took the job of a warrior cast person. Well, my my remembrance of that was he was half and half. His mother was of one, his father was of the other, and he was raised according to I guess his the mom. religious. Yeah, but, but when the time came, he had to become warrior, and that's part of how the war the religious cast gained so much power was um because he was he was really straddling the fences both but the the man was legitimately both warrior and religious cast and religious yeah. okay that's my so know Nar- but somebody out there's typing going no 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 and yeah that's cool it's f- cool please don't tell us actually we'll catch it on <laughs> on the second watch through but but i think assuming uh, i want to assume we don't know Narun might have some similar ancestry because mm. What I think is going to happen is that the next step is the warrior cast rising up pre-Civil War. Yeah. But to seal that breach yep. and to um, cleanse the blood between the casts, mm-hmm. Naroon is going to switch to religious cast. Wow. In the footsteps of his idol, yeah. who he paraded around in legacies. And because what he learned today is the unfortunate, to him, the unfortunate truth that he doesn't know about the one, yeah. you know, or yeah. whatever. That, I don't know if that means anything to him, but he knows that Delenn has real power. Yeah. And 
you can be on the side of power and rise or you can fight it and lose. And I, so I think he's gonna, I, I think he basically threw his hat in yeah. through the pike with the land. Yeah. And I think he's going to become religious cast. That's that's, and that'll save everything. Yeah. That's, I want to challenge you just a little bit on he's throwing his hat in because of the power as much as I like what I want to believe is he understands the reason behind it, that it's really not about 100%. the power, but it's about, Hey, actually, there's there's something here that's bigger than all of us. You know what you describing that makes me think of the. It makes me think of. Was his name Drawl, from the Troll Hunters show? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. That, yep. that uh, and for those of you listen, guys, I this is a little bit of a spoiler, but it's like an episode three spoiler, where in this particular case, the guy who was supposed to be the heir of the Troll Hunter. Uh, now has to face off against the guy who has actually been chosen to be the new troll hunter and he doesn't like it, but and he's a filthy human that became the troll. Hunter. Yeah. And like, no, that's supposed to be mine. I was the next uh -huh. guy in line. That's mine. And he actually wound up having to, uh, subservience, not the right word. What, what's the word, Jeff, uh, mentor mentor. Yeah. This guy who actually took what was supposed to be his by birthright, supposedly it wasn't, but it was supposed to be. Uh, but he wound up joining the team of this person who had what actually should have been his. That very much sounds like what's happening here with Naroon, at least as far as your uh, prediction yeah. goes. Totally. And and I'll talk about it more in the closing thoughts, but I there's the power that he's, I, I believe, he's attracted to, but it's not the power. Mm -hmm. It's what the power can accomplish. Sure. And it's a concept we've talked about with Londo yeah. where like he'll take on that emperor. Uh-huh you know, role, not because he aspires to be emperor, but because he wants what's best for the Centauri people. Right. Naroon throughout this whole thing just wants what he believes is best for the Minbari. Mm. So, and he needs that power to do it. So we're, we're getting into that spot, Jeff, where it's time to really start analyzing it. And it's really going to come down to this last scene before we get there though. I do just want to say with Naroon and Marcus, isn't this really how it works amongst dudes a lot of times where look, we can get into a fight, knock down, drag out fight. But when the fight's over, we also can go have a beer with each other. Now, I don't know. I remember, I remember the first time I ever experienced that for me growing up, I was in seventh grade and I wound up getting into a fight with this dude who was in and out of juvie. Ooh. Like this was not a good guy. Like he reached up, flipped glasses off my face. I'm a big dude. I was always a big dude. So he and I stood toe to toe, you know, and this guy was a bit of a bit of a bully, you know, mm -hmm. but, uh, we went at it. Uh, we really went at it. But as soon as that was over, this dude was like, he was looking at me. He's like, Hey, if you ever wind up in juvie, I'll take care of you. Oh. I'll be, I'll be. And this guy was like my friend from that moment on. I don't even remember his name. He must have gone to juvie really soon after that because I don't think I ever saw him <laughs> too much longer after that. Uh, but if you are out there and you're watching, hey, what's up, man? Uh, I still remember you. Um, but it really was that idea of just the the amazingness of what it is. And I'm not saying this is a dude thing. Okay, right. please don't hear me wrong out there, folks. But just that ability of like, yeah, we can fight, but we can go have a beer too at, at the end and and let let the fight be done. We had an experience about a year ago. Um, my daughter, she goes to a Catholic school and it's a different environment there. Mm -hmm. And it was, oh, I was early in the school year, but a fist fight happened. Oh, no. It's a pre-kindergarten through eighth grade school. So okay. um, lots of ages. It was two middle school kids and they got into a fist fight. And that's the first time my daughter had experienced anything like that before. Like a lot of, a lot of the kids saw it. And so she came home and she had questions, you know, and so, you know, we were talking about using your words and conflict resolution yeah. and all the things that, you know, as a parent, you're supposed to do. But my, my wife and I were talking afterwards about how fascinating it is exactly what you were talking about. You know, I got into some fights when I was in grade school and middle school, and I know a lot of other people that did, and it was, that was generally the experience, you know, you roughed uh -huh. each other up for a couple of days, your fist hurt, your face hurt. And then you were fine. Like it was okay. But the school response, right. Was like, you're suspended, expelled. You're never coming back to like, it was this extreme response, mm -hmm. but the lasting effects were minimal. Now kids go out and 
emotionally abuse, taunt, and traumatize people, mentally abuse, taunt, and traumatize each other with lasting impacts. In 40 years, these kids are going to be bringing this stuff in therapy right. with long-lasting impacts. And teachers and administrators in schools are like, all right, so stop it. Let's not do it. And it's that whole like misapplication of to talk about justice, but it's like, that fight is obvious and we know academically fighting is wrong. Right. And so we can respond to that, but you know, it's more complicated about like the real hurt that we experience and we don't take that as seriously. We just thought it was an interesting observation that we experienced. Oh, well, Jeff, un unless you have anything else. Um, well, so I, I wanted to get your opinion. Sure. They're, they're going back. In, so Narun is talking to him while he's passed out, you mm -hmm. know, whatever turns out he's not passed out he turns around and he talks and it is a very awkward slow and pained delivery for uh for him to kind of you know for marcus to respond w w i'm curious what your reaction was to that just that the way that sequence was acted out and directed Like his delivery, you know, for for Marcus specifically, or for Noreen, yeah. or for both of them, for Marcus, for Marcus, um, or did I see something that you didn't even didn't register for you? I I mean, I thought it was fine. He was beat up and he was struggling through his injuries. I will say this: the makeup for what it would have looked like him being that beaten up was not anywhere near what he would have actually looked like. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was um, not sufficient. Yeah. And <laughs> the way he was struggling to get words out was not commiserate with what the visual of the makeup was. Okay. But that to me is a makeup issue, not a, a direction or an acting issue. Um, because I, th I think he delivered the line. Okay. It was an awkward line. It was an awkwardly written line. It seemed to me, um, I'm glad yeah. you felt that way. Yeah. Cause but I didn't think I too thought much it was a well, like I thought it was a well written line actually, yeah. given the situation. He, he's probably heavily concussed. Yeah. He I my assumption was his jaw was broken. And my mm -hmm. thought was the acting and the directing and the writing here all came together in a really cool way. Everyone did their job. Yeah. It was the editing and the makeup that just kind of made him look ridiculous a little bit. Um, yeah. I could, but it's I still could. shown through. Sure. Sure. I, I mean, honestly, at that point, I'd also dealt with the Zarg and there's that Robert England and all of that sort of stuff. <laughs> I literally, I literally forgot that was a part of this episode. Yeah. And like, <laughs> like I, like, like I'm, just right now, right sure. now I did. <laughs> like I'm in that moment though. Like, and I'm, my mind is spinning on all the stuff that Naroon has just said. And he's like, Hey, I need a moment with this guy. Warrior to warrior, man to man, you know? And, 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 uh, he's like, we're not of the same blood, but we are of the same heart. And, you know, uh, just how things changed for him. Uncomfortable was not the word I thought Marcus was going to use. Something a little less painful, something a little less um, extreme, something a little less uncomfortable. Like, that, I, I thought that word was weird, but I was still thinking about everything else personally. Yeah. So. Well, I think that um, it's a great segue for us to start talking about that talk specifically, yeah. which is where we start looking to see what kind of sci-fi, what kind of Star Trek -y message this episode has. Um, I'm going to do that by rating this on a scale of zero to five deltas. And Brent, you have the responsibility of rating this on a scale of zero to five star theories, which is how much we liked it and how Babylon 5 the episode was, I'm going to go first and it really does land in that whole kind of last scene with Marcus Naroon and, um, Delenn and Lanier. Lanier and Delenn are talking and he says, Lanier says to her, you cherish life. Life is your goal, but for the greater part to live, some must die or be harmed in its defense. Mm. Now, I feel like I've heard that before, except it sounded a little bit more like the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. And the one, that takes on a whole new meaning for us now in Babylon 5. 
In Star Trek, Spock, for example, is willing to die to save the Enterprise crew at the end of the Wrath of Khan. In this episode, Marcus, willing to die for Delenn because her life and her new position will save countless lives. So now, like in this Babylon 5 episode, it's uh, the needs of the many or the one outweigh the needs of the few, right? It flips that and we capitalize mm-hmm. it. But I love the take on this concept. You and I really appreciated Naroon eventually in when he was in Legacies. You know, he was laser focused on his goal. He was true to his beliefs and he gave that textbook apology to Sinclair. Sure. Or Valen. Sinclair. Yeah, it was Sinclair back then. <laughs> But then he went all racial purist and super bad guy in All Alone in the Night when he fired Delenn. And now he started from that point, right? And dropped all that racial purity stuff again and ended pretty amazing because just like in Legacies, he was once again focused on his goal and his and his beliefs and his belief in the greater the greater capabilities of of the Minbari. Through that fight with Marcus, he through that fight, he he lost his he was no longer blinded by his personal ego or by his feelings towards Delenn. I think in um All Alone in the Night, it was made very clear that he has a, a lot of a lot of dislike towards her. But he sticks to his belief, and ultimately he ends up willing to die. Or at least for his ego to die, because he admits. He admits that he was wrong. He yeah. admits that humans and Minbari, like you said, may share the same heart. He dies He dies to self for what he believes in and what he believes is important to Minbari culture. For him, the needs of the many outweigh his personal vendetta, his feelings, and any personal um, aspirations that he had. The story between Marcus and Naroon, but also both of them being willing to die for what is foundational for them, mm-hmm. which is really Minbari culture. And in Marcus's case, Delenn as well. It's incredible. It's it, it alone. This whole Minbari thing makes this episode worth watching multiple, yep. multiple times yep. again. I'm going to skip ahead in some parts when I watch it again, but this one based on this star Trek message, that is masterfully told in a way that only Babylon five can tell. Yeah. I'm going to give this episode three deltas. So you talk about, um, comparing what Narun said to the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few mm-hmm. or the one. I actually want to go compare that to something else. Okay. I want to compare that to what, Kosh slash Jaquan told Jakar in Ooh. his little vision that in order to save them all, some must die. And I probably didn't say that exactly right, but it's that same general idea. And, and Jakar struggled with that concept of in order, in order to save the whole, some are going to have to be sacrificed, right? which isn't, it, it's not cozy. It's not, uh, uh, pretty the way it is in star Trek. It is very different. Lanier struggled to kind of get that same idea out. And he, he understands this concept. Like we're not going to come out of this perfectly clean. There's going to be, I, I, it actually raises the question to me who on the DVD cover as a character is going to die by the time this war is over. Now we know Londo and Jakar die at the very end, mm-hmm. right? That's a different situation. But, uh, you know, remember, uh, Delenn told Sheridan in the future, the cost has been really high to secure the thing. Is Garibaldi sacrificed? Is Ivanova sacrificed? Is, uh, please go ahead and sacrifice Franklin. Yeah. <laughs> Don't sacrifice Lanier, but is he sacrificed? Is, is Lanier sacrificed? Like, like who? Are, and that's just the DVD card. Oh, Zach. Oh, would you be heartbroken if it got if it was Zach? I'd be sad. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I'm willing. Hey, by the way, I'm Lanier. sorry. 
Zach needs to join the spinoff of the like the, side the sidekicks, kicks, right? Yeah. Him and Veer and uh, Lanier and Natoth yeah. can go away. Well, I'm willing. I am willing to offer um, to the sacrificial uh, points that are coming. I'm willing to offer Franklin, and I'm willing to offer Natoth. Um, <laughs> And, and you know what, because he hasn't been around, I'll offer Lou as well. Uh, That's my gimme. I don't want to, but Lou has made his choice. So hopefully that'll help save Lanier in the, I'll offer the new Kosh as well. (laughs) (laughs) We don't even know them yet. Right. Right. Um, so my whole point in saying that, um, I don't, I think this episode and the value of this episode is inextricably linked to the Naroon Marcus Delenn storyline and the enjoyment of this episode being an episode that JMS has had to apologize for or feels like he has to apologize for admitting that the whole gray 17 stuff is junk. Okay. It's, it's, it's goofy. You can forgive it. It's popcorn munching, you know, Saturday, the 14th strikes back. Not even really that good kind of a stuff, you know, um, the gold of it is in this, what makes this episode enjoyable. Jeff is the, what we would call the star Trek message. And I said, put that in big air quotes because to what you said, this did it in a way that only Babylon five could do. And we, I, we, we've done this before. I pulled it out a couple of weeks ago, but I think it's time to bring it back. Yeah. Yeah. This, this episode is, it's not just, Hey, did we like the episode? And it's got star furies. This was an episode that meant something. It talked about something and it did it in a uniquely Babylon five way in a way that nobody else could do. So I give this one three star. I'm sorry three delta furies i love it i love it and it is like to your point there there's just babylon 5 for us has established itself as a mechanism for delivering these messages Mm -hmm. it's the point of sci-fi it's the point of art it's the point of creation is to tell difficult to hear and difficult to consume messages Mm -hmm. in a way that becomes consumable and babylon 5 is doing it in a way that no other series has been able to and it has drawn us in in ways that other series can't and so i applaud your use of the delta fury but brent your job isn't over and in fact you have a very difficult one i do (laughs) do. coming up right now we are developing the definitive objectively correct ranking of all of the episodes of the third season of babylon 5. our current rankings have war without end part two War Without End Part 1, then Severed Dreams, Point of No Return, and then Ship of Tears. Gray 17 might be missing, but it needs to be ranked somewhere. Brent, where do you put it? Jeff, this is an episode, uh, and I've, I actually thought about this long before I got to this spot, so I've, I've put a lot of thought into this one. Um, I think this is an episode that is more valuable than people realize. I said earlier, this is the TKO of season three. Um, and I, I definitely, I, it's more than I have a chance to go through into this podcast. Maybe this will be Babylon five for the second time. I really want to go back and rewatch this and try to see the Naroon Marcus storyline through the eyes of the stuff happening with the Zarg, right? Like I, I just, I feel like something's there. That's just not connecting for me yet that I haven't been able to figure out. I hope it's there. Maybe, maybe it's the name Zarg. Maybe that stops it from connect. I mean, so I'm sorry. (laughs) We're done talking about the episode, but we didn't Zarg. That's what it's okay. Sorry. I feel like we've heard that name before though. Really? I don't feel like this is the first time we've heard it. I feel like we've heard it. I could be wrong. Anyway, that being said, um, I did find this, this episode rather enjoyable, but I think this episode is also important because of the message that comes from it. I don't think it's going to stay this high. I think we have what three episodes left of the season, Mm -hmm. which is, is going to push. I think this episode down, I'm assuming these are going to be fantastic episodes. So I am actually going to place this episode in the top half. 
Really? But not so far into the top half that if these next three episodes are killer, it will push it out of the top half. But I'm going to place this one right next to another episode that is not a, hey, let's run out and go watch this episode again. But we also said that it was a really important episode. I'm putting it right next to Passing Through Gethsemane, which is number eight. And I think Passing Through Gethsemane is actually more important than this one uh, with the material that it goes into and what it covers with uh, Brad Dourif and, and feelings of guilt and actually kind of a theme for the season that we said. So I'm placing it right between passing through Gethsemane and the season premiere of matters of honor. Number nine. Wow. Wow. You put TKO in the top five. Just it's a great episode though. <laughs> I will, I will die on that hill. Yes, and will. in the vein of that, I will say that, uh, if I had arguments against your ranking, they don't matter. We don't get to argue. We don't get to argue that, but, uh, yeah, we do. We do have more episodes to get to, so we'll see. We'll see where this lands out because this closes us out for Gray Seventeen is missing. Next week, Brent, we are watching, and the rocks cried out, "No hiding place," for what? the first time. Yeah, and the rocks cried out, "No hiding place," or is it? And the rock cried out, and the rock cried out, "No hiding place." Wait, is this? Is this like two separate titles of the episode? There's a comma. So Are there quotation marks? Like, did The Rock say no hiding place? The Rock, it doesn't matter what The Rock said. <laughs> <They're> the <laughs> and The Rock cried out no hiding place. Okay, that's it. That's that's what I, this is. It's Sunkatsu. Th this is the episode <laughs> where we try to pull in the WWE figure of the day right we're, we're cross promoting here mm -hmm. right uh so maybe it's the undertaker it's big show maybe it's i doubt it's the rock maybe it is i don't know rock um, this is 96 so rock is just just coming to us it might be sean michaels somebody like that uh, right right yeah. right like we're, we're steve starting austin's, that. steve austin's really hitting his stride right now but they didn't they're, do any TV they're coming they're hunting and there's no place you can hide they're coming to get you there's no place you can hide because this guy is coming to get you. Okay. There has been a decidedly Catholic theme to this season. I was thinking that too, but yeah. I like the wrestler idea better. So go ahead. I, I like the wrestler I'm, I, idea. I'm glad you're picking well. up this theme. So go for it. Yeah. Because right when you hear The Rock, if you're not, you don't go Dwayne Johnson, you got to think about Peter, who's the, mm. you know, the, the, the rock of the church. First Pope. Yeah. And when I think Peter... I think apostolic succession. Mm -hmm. And when I think apostolic succession in Babylon five, I think about brother Theo and the monks that we haven't seen in a oh. super, super long time. Not since passing through Gethsemane, I think. <laughs> right? right. So what I think is going to happen is I think that Theo and his crew are going to confront Londo Ooh. about his atrocities. Oh, um, there's no hiding place, right? They're going to, yeah. oh no, no, this is what's going to happen. So they're doing their stuff, right? Trying to learn about the names of, the God. of, yeah. of God. And they're going to talk to Jakar about Jaquan. And in that, he's going to talk about his dust to dust vision of Londo mm. and how all of this is Londo's fault. And they're going to go to Londo and in the spirit of trying to get him to uh, accept it and confess yep. and ask for forgiveness and everything. And I don't think it's going to end well for brother Theo. Ooh. I don't think he's going to die necessarily in this one, but I could see him getting added to the, uh, to Londo's Morden list kind of a thing along with Rifa and his crew. Are we going to see the, um, the person that replaced Brad Dorf. Oh, wow. Is he going to come back? And like, is Sheridan going to have to deal with his feelings about this dude again? I think so. Cause I mean, we're in the last three, right? Yeah. This is heavy stuff. I think he is going to be faced with that. Ooh. Ooh, I like that. Could be, could be, but we're going to find out right here next week. Thank you all so much for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe or follow us wherever you're listening or watching and go. We are doing our season three wrap up in just a couple of weeks from now. And in that wrap up, we're giving away 
not one, but two star theories that were 3D printed and donated by our buddy Wash. They look incredible. And if you want to get your hands on one of these star theories, go to Apple Podcasts, go to Podchaser, Good Pods, any of those places, Audible, write us a rating, a review. Not only will you be entered to win a star theory, but we'll read it here on the podcast. So until next time. Hey, hey Jeff. Yeah, yeah, man, what's up? Um, so I, I feel like I actually need to apologize. Oh, for for what? Well, for Gray 17 is missing. For for this episode um of the podcast, like the whole part with the Zarg and trying to make it a metaphor for what was going on with Narun, it, it, it just didn't really work. And I just want to apologize to you and the fans out there for trying to force that out there. Brent, whatever it is, it can't be that bad. Oh, actually, I didn't think it was that bad either. I kind of liked the idea. Good. Yeah. Okay. We got that settled. Totally agree. Peace, victory, and long life. It's my first time. It's that time again, Jeff. It is time for Club 65, baby. All right, that's, uh, I'm never going to do that. I again. saw somebody ask in a comment not too long ago. Uh, presumably, you guys have, have mentioned Club 65 in the comments out there, and, and I'm assuming yeah. this person, who has been around for a while, like this is Quite not a, a new a new person who's like okay i got it what is this club 65 thing that everyone's talking about and i kind of felt like a jerk because <laughs> my response was like if you know what club 65 is then you know and if you don't then you don't and we don't talk about club 65. my friends if this is your first time here you have now entered club 65 you're inducted into the club your membership is now complete club 65 is our after show so, uh, hey, drop a 65 down in the comments for us down there, guys. We let you let us Love know that it. you stayed. You guys are awesome because that means you stayed all the way to the end of the video, at least to this part of the video. <laughs> yeah. Who knows how much longer right. it's going to go. Right. Uh, but And hit this guy right down here, uh -huh. bit.ly slash B5Club65. Yeah. We got gear on there that's sold at cost. Brent and I don't make a penny uh -huh. off that. That's just for you to uh, show off your membership. But when you do so, and please share it, yeah. but don't tell anyone what it is. Because if you know, you know. And if you don't, you don't. Jeff, was there was there anything in your notes that you didn't get to bring up just because of the course of the conversation? Because I got a, I got a handful of stuff. And this would be oh, really? a great spot to like kind of go through some yeah. of the things that didn't make it into the into the show. So I closed my notes, but the one thing I remember that I had in there was when Delenn was sharing her family story and she yep. talked about her mom uh, going to the Sisters of Valeria. Right. And I feel like, um, I feel like I'm wrong, but when, um, when Kosh, when Kosh slipped out of his, when, when his gear and flew up to save Sheridan, I think that's what they said they, the Minbari saw was Valeria. Interesting. That's wasn't there. wasn't Valeria where the um the elves were trying to go to in Lord of the Rings? Was it? Maybe. No. No, no. Valeria's a Game of Thrones thing. Old Valeria. Okay. Like it was the the old kingdom. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's what it was. That's what it was. I don't think JMS pulled that from Game of Thrones. Or I'd be weird. Song of Ice and Fire. Although I think Song I mean, of Ice and Fire was out like First books was were out actually? in the 90s. I think they I think they came out in the 90s. I mean, he could be stealing it from us. We all know yes. that, you know, we've crossed the space-time continuum. Yes. Time travel works himself. and it folds back on itself. So, mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Um Okay, we didn't talk about it at all. Dude at the beginning trying to be a fake telepath to get a job. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. That's pretty great. Jeff, I'm a this, quick learner. Listen. <laughs> Listen, when, when we come back and we do like favorite moments of the entire, like, I, cause I kind of foresee like when we get to the end of the show, like we might actually do like episodes, like a bunch of top five lists. Yeah. And yeah. like one of those top five lists should probably, we should probably write this down so we don't forget it. But one of those top five lists should be something like top five best opening sequences of the show. 
Oh, okay, yeah, and there's yeah. the one where Garibaldi and Sinclair put Ivanova to sleep and played the totally. trick on her. Mm -hmm. Um, there's the one where oh shoot, there was one recently. Um, there was the one with Lanier like uh, sitting down next to dude who kept wouldn't shut up and talk, and then he told him that he had right, some disease. Right. There's that <laughs> one. There was one from season two. Was it "There Lies All the Honor" or "There All the Honor Lies"? Um. I want to say it was that one. What was what was that one? It was another joke one that they were doing on each other. Um, oh, I really, I really. Uh, oh, that was the one where they got the shop. Oh, and there was the there was, was the whole conversation between uh, Sheridan and Ivanova about who's going to run the shop and why it's here, and she, she does the. Uh, this station isn't some deep space franchise. It stands for something like that. That. That was in the open, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. This this opening with him trying to to pretend like I'm not saying it's top three, but it, it's like number four or five. Like it was a good one. I was looking. I, I want the dude didn't get a credit, and I'm like, I want to know who that because I feel like he's somebody, right? You know, like was he some com up and coming comedian back then or something? But Zach was awesome too. He's just mm -hmm. like, all right, then what am I thinking? <laughs> and he goes, <laughs> "You're cute too." <laughs> Which hey, by the way, uh, way to way to slide in a reference like that in the mid '90s, man. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like I know it was played for laugh, and we don't want to we don't want to play that off for laugh. But to slide something in and get it past the censors like that, like it's pretty smooth. Yeah, right. Um, so I didn't talk about this, but the idea of Delenn talking to Lanier, and because we, we were talking about what Lanier said. Of like some people have to are gonna have to mm. die in order for all this. The other side of that though was Delin sitting there going, I am the one and people are going to die for me. Like she's going to be the one to send people to their death. Or yeah. like we die for the one. We live for the one, we die for the one. Like people are going to sacrifice their lives for her. And she's gotta come to terms with that idea. Yeah. Which is pretty like, that's a pretty heavy uh, thought there. It's very heavy stuff, but I mean, but it's interesting too, because we saw a different side of that too, with Naroon when he was fighting Marcus and he's like, I killed 50,000 of you Yeah, in the war. Like what's this where you have Delenn who is just like the, even the concept of someone dying as a result of her is abhorrent to her as a really good dichotomy. Mm -hmm. Um, that's all I really had. How would you, yeah. what about the Zarg cult? Did you ever think, how did that thing get started? Like we're going to, we're going to be down in here in this thing. And the only way to rejoin the universe is to go get eaten by this monster. Like, well, and I think what's even more, more interesting than that. Yeah. How'd they know about the Minbari religion? Like where'd they learn all that from? There weren't any Minbari down mm. there. Is that something people know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, haven't we heard that JMS, like he had time in cults, like, like that was part of his upbringing. Like, I don't, know. I, I don't, I don't know the full story, but I feel like I've heard that that was actually literally a part of his deal. So, I mean, this might've honestly been his own little personal therapy side little thing. To, yeah. To, 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 to He's like, I got some know. money. I can hire Robert England. Like, let's, right. let's, let me just work through this a right. little bit. Listen, this was the perfect spot for, for Robert England though. Yeah. Like, it didn't make any sense. It was goofy, but it was a horror flick. It was, he was a crazy dude. Yeah. And I'm not talking Dwight Schultz crazy. I'm right. talking David Koresh crazy. And it's exactly, he played that role. He, with what was put on the paper, he brought that role to life. You know, what's so cool is like, cause he was Freddie in the eighties, you know, that started in the eighties yeah. and those slasher flicks in the eighties, which are some, they're some of my favorite. I love uh -huh. that genre so much, uh -huh. but the bad guys didn't always make sense. They didn't have a motivation. They didn't have, they were just evil bad guys. And that's part of why I think he was so perfect for this where, you know, cause I, I can almost imagine like read the script and he's like, okay, so you know, what's my motivation? What brought me here? And they're just like, yeah, dude, I don't, I don't know. Right. Like, you're there. Just do it. Just, <laughs> we, we got this cool costume. We're waiting to show off. That's so you're just to build up for the costume. And then he's like, 
that? Hey, can I get paid before I don't tape anything? Right. <laughs> Fly by night operation. Right. All right. Well, Jeff, that's all that's all I had. That was an uh, extra notes idea. That's we good stuff. Too. So. Well, I've left the sign up the whole time right here. Yeah. The Club sixty five thing. We can't click it, but you should be able to type it in. Go buy your gear and show us the stuff. Right? Right? Do that. We would love to see it. You tweet at us. Drop 65 down in the comments, guys. Thanks for saying to hang out with us. Jeff, did you think that Gray 17 is missing was going to be one of our longest episodes to date? I know. It, it's one of my shortest on like my notes, but part of it is like I wrote the recap. Yeah. And I totally, like when I watched the episode and Garibaldi did that thing, I'm like, I am lying. I'm word for word using and at first i was only going to use that for the recap mm -hmm. but then i'm like oh no there's all this other stuff that happens but still that was my shortest recap ever and uh i don't have a didn't have a ton of notes but there's a lot to dive into there for was stuff. A, there was so there was this episode is a lot more than what people i think give it credit for maybe this is why they named the podcast gray 17 yeah because there's more to it than meets the <gasps> eye that meant scott good job buddy good, good job good. i yeah. like it i like it now I like it. Scott's going to hear the first part of this. He's not going to, he's not a clip 65 guy. I don't he's think not. Uh, if you are Scott. Awesome. But, uh, uh, he's, he, so he's, he's going to be, we're going to be getting d DMS and stuff from him. We're like, dude, you should watch to the end. I trust go, go, go to one hour and 50 minutes. And he's going to be like one hour and 50 minutes. What's wrong with you guys? It's not that good of an episode. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. All right, guys, we're going to get out of here. Uh, we'll see you guys next week. I can't wait to see what people r respond to this episode with the way we went. Cause I don't no. think people are giving this episode much of a chance. So no. All right. Bye guys. See ya.